all of us have a period in of our life, no matter what it is, that we could create a business out of something that frustrates us, that we see a niche, like a, a missing part of the industry, if you will. Yeah. Starting or growing your business is hard work. But now you are listening to the Better Business Podcast with me, Steve Cook, and I'm going to try and make it a little easier on you. We on this podcast help you grow a better business with real advice from professionals, and today is no different. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Better Business Podcast. I'm your host for today, Steve Cook, and my guest is a lady by the name of Melissa Wedman. She is a actually a horticulturist who accidentally started an artisan com- candy company in 2016. Of course, there was a, another career pivot in the middle of landscaping professionally and started Maudie, Molly, I can't even say it, Melissa, Molly Coddled Hash Slinger in memory of her late father. But there is one common sweet spot for Melissa. She has a passion for growing small businesses herself and for helping other small business owners grow their businesses. Molly Coddled Hash Slinger is an artisan candy company that focuses on supporting other micro to small businesses through their entire supply chain, including using many Oklahoman sourced ingredients in their candies. As the head sugar slinger, aka the CEO, Melissa not only created their signature salted whiskey caramel, but she has a vision for putting a unique spin on old school candies that over time have become lost with mass produced candies. I'm sorry about the mispronunciations. <laughs> You're good. We're used to it. This has to be your freaking number one question. Explain your name. So Molly Coddle just means spoiled or pampered. Um, It's an old term, of course, that was lost years ago. And then hash slinger slang for sugar or for chef or cook. So I started a food blog years ago and, um, you know, when food blogs were cool. (laughs) And that kind of got lost, but I owned the domain. And then as the accidental start to the candy business happened, I was like, okay, I need to create a little bit of an e-commerce platform so friends and family can order. You know, I wasn't even thinking about the public ordering. And um, so I owned the domain. Why spend more money? And just it grew from there. So That's incredible. Now, I need to know where you stand on the caramel versus caramel. How do you, how do you, where do you stand it's on caramel that? for me? Caramel. It's car- but it's, you know, it's pecan and pecan and, um, like we make pralines. I have Cajun influence in my life. So it's a praline, not a praline, but I know in Oklahoma, everyone says praline. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's caramel for me. So let's talk about your business a little bit. Um, obviously you had done some other things before this, but, um, you know, I was reading on your website, uh, before and uh, doing a little homework on you and, I saw that there was something about an incubator program. Is that true? Yep, it was. Tell me um, about that. So my husband and I are not new to business, but we were new to manufacturing food business. Sure. And so there's a whole set of new laws and rules you have to abide by, of course. Um, but was that with so many other industries, there's a lot of gray area and not a lot of good information, black and white. This is what you can or can't do available online. Um, and then, of course, it varies state to state. So Um, I had been making caramel from home for about a year and a half. And at that point in time, we had already met the threshold of what you were allowed to make from a home-based food business um, within the state of Oklahoma. And so it was like, okay, we have to take this commercially, but I have no idea how to do that and what the rules are. So I kind of get a little obsessive with research. (laughs) And I'd done the most research I possibly could online and still really wasn't getting clear answers. And so my husband and I were watching the news um, one Sunday morning. We were living in the Tulsa area at the time. And there was a husband and wife um, on the news that make salsa. And they were talking about this incubator program that helped them launch commercially. And it was just like, you know, God's way of putting us in front of the TV at the right time to see that and um, researched a little bit about Kitchen 66, which is still in operation. We were part of their second graduating class back in 2016. um, And they're hitting the ground running. They're part of the Lobeck Taylor Family Foundation. Um, So anybody that wants to start a food business, whether it be a restaurant or a manufacturing food business, you can go through their um, mentorship program, learn all the laws, the rules, and then they have a commercial kitchen you can rent by the hour. 
Wow. So it was a great launching pad. So for I us. think I know the answer then if uh, the kind of the way you had phrased that, but, um, do they, do you pay them up front or is it a nonprofit deal or do they take a, you know, it is a nonprofit business? organization, but you do have to have an investment. And at the time I want to say it was somewhere around $350 for a three month program. And once a week we had, I mean, it was like going back to college again. Mm-hmm. Once a week we were in class for, I don't even remember. It's been so long, three or four hours, you know, to learn different segments of food industry business. And uh, then we quote graduated. Hey. And at that point we get licensed through um, the Tulsa County health department. Huh. And then we actually have our state manufacturing license because we're a manufacturer. So uh, there's a little bit different um, requirements there, but they walk you through the, all the pre-work, the testing, the market for your product, the packaging, the everything, and then help you launch it from there. So it was a small investment. So So let me ask you this, uh, hindsight, looking back, you know, if somebody is listening to this and is interested in food manufacturing of some sorts or any, you know, food business, is that a path that you would recommend? Or do you think that you could have got there with some more research or just, um, I think I could have gotten there had I had a mentor, um, you know, somebody that had been there and done that. But I think it is a great program. You know, if you're in the Tulsa area, for sure. If you're in the Oklahoma City market, it might be a little bit of a drive for you each week. And then once you're in production in their kitchen, that's, of course, a drive. So um, it was great for us at the time because we lived in that area. But, you know, I think if you can reach out to a mentor, find someone that's not necessarily been there and done that with the exact product you want to make, but just someone that knows the food rules, if you will, that can guide you through the process. You can get there on your own pretty easily. Sure. So to kind of tee up some of the questions or some of the things that we'll talk about later, um, in, in a way of giving a little bit of background about yourself, you had mentioned that, you know, you started before you opened a retail store, you had started a, um, cooking out of your home and then, you know, making things in a commercial kitchen, give the somewhat thousand foot overview of your business. Where does the bulk of your business come from? Uh, corporate gifting is really the bread and butter of our business. I have a special heart for helping small businesses stand out among their competitors and kind of send that special message. And so we love working B2B, um, whether it's, you know, when you've got a referral coming in and you want to send a little thank you or, you know, holiday gifts, whatever it may be, like promo, like logo items are not a thank you gift. You know, they have their place. Um, but I'm sorry when you send someone a ball cap with your name on it, it doesn't really make them feel special. It doesn't make them feel appreciated. They're like, Oh, thanks for the hat, you know, and, and they might wear it, but if you are getting referrals from somebody and you're essentially making a couple thousand dollars or more over the lifetime of that new client, you need to show genuine appreciation. So Corporate gifting for us is that, you know, we have a very unique candy product and we like to be able to use our product as a way for um, that small business to show their appreciation to those important to their company. And who is, you know, who would be a ideal customer for you? Would it be like a realtor? Would it be a, you know, what, what would an ideal customer look like for you? So we absolutely love working with realtors. Um, We are happy to work with one gift at a time or hundreds or thousands at a time. So we have oil and gas construction industries that work with us for hundreds and thousands at a time. And then we do have a lot of realtors, um, car dealerships, some of those types of companies, mortgage lenders that need, you know, maybe 20 a month or five a month sent out. We are totally happy with working from one end to the other. Um, I always say we're small enough that we can customize something for your budget, but we're big enough that we can handle the bigger volume for you too. You bet. So in this subject that we're trying to um, kind of keep this podcast to being peculiar, being unique mm-hmm. um, in making your business stand out from other businesses, I noticed that you um, try to source, and, and we even read about in your introduction, you try to source from um, local places and other small businesses. And in all honesty, do you think that that is something that just makes you feel good? Um, and you want to do that no matter what, you know, there's stuff in our business. I'm like, no, we're going to do this. I don't care if it's profitable or not. Or do you think it actually helps your business at the end of the day? Um, all, (laughs) all of the above, (laughs) even better, you know, growing up in a, I don't want to say it's a, it's not a small town anymore, but growing up in Yukon, um, there yeah, it's are like so one of the biggest small... towns in Oklahoma. You can't say that. It, it really is. <laughs> and I always say that the state of Oklahoma is a big town. Mm-hmm. Like it, it's not six degrees of separation. It's two or three yeah. in Oklahoma. But, you know, growing up in Yukon at the time I did, 
we still, and there still is a local hardware store. And my dad was that foundation of educating me at my early childhood of why we shop made in America and why we shop with small businesses in our community. And when you really think about that, that, you know, they might only employ five people, but those five people are your neighbors. The profit from your purchase is not going out of state to some corporate office. And then maybe only 30% of that staying within your state, more like 80% stays within your state. So my dad started that foundation with us growing up and it's just carried forward from there. Um, But communities. And it's not even about sales tax dollars. Like people talk about, oh, tax revenue. Well, guess what, guys? These big companies know how to find the loopholes and not pay tax. Um, And so many, like the boundaries, like UConn as a community, so much of that retail growth is outside of UConn city limits. So they don't benefit from that sales tax anyway. But when you support small and local, the payroll dollars, the livelihood stay in that community. So it really comes more full circle than shopping with a large chain. So for us with, you know, the candy business, if I can't find something sourced in Oklahoma, it's going to be sourced in America. It will not be sourced anywhere else. Um, You know, we all have family across the nation. So I like to think that I'm helping my aunt's community (laughs) by buying our labels there or whatever it may be. So So to push, not to disagree with you, but to push back on that, I feel like I have seen this um, attitude, I guess you could say, come off as somewhat entitlement by some. Um, I've seen, you know, whether it be Facebook rants or customers ranting to me or whatever it might be of, they don't support local, they don't blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, yeah, it's because you're closed at four o'clock every day and you, you know, right. I've, I feel like some business owners, this is from a business owner's perspective, some sure. business owners use it as a crutch to say like, yeah, they should shop with me. I'm local, blah, blah, blah. But they're not running as good of a business as a large <laughs> company. Do you right. feel like some people use that as a crutch? Absolutely. And I think the flip side is, is like niching down and creating your products line, whether you're a retail store bringing in products or you make your own you have to know your demographic. And depending on the type of business you run, you need to know what time of day or week they prefer to shop. And if you go, oh, if if I build it, they'll come, that's not always the case. So I absolutely think that's important. You know, um, I've heard a lot of people say, oh, well, XYZ is not an emergency. They'll come back tomorrow. Well, if you're in a high traffic commuter highway area in a small community and you're closed out, you know, not during those times, you're going to lose a huge percentage of that revenue. So I absolutely agree with you. Like just because you're small doesn't mean you can um, have a bad attitude (laughs) on, you know, well, they'll come when I'm here. That that's not the case. And that's that attitude is why so many small businesses fail eventually. Yeah. And it's like I said, it almost comes off as uh, anger to me because I'm like, no, you're entitled. Like if you're not as good as, you know, I want people to shop with me because they think, my pricing is better. My product offering is better. You know, my employees are nicer. You know, I want people. So I almost, you know, I, I completely understand what you're saying, but oftentimes I feel, um, almost anger at people that use that as a a sales pitch because they're saying, you know, a lot of people basically use it as a, uh, Hey, we're not as good as these other people, but you should shop with us out of a guilt, you know? Well, and think about it this way. Like we're all in an Amazon world, you know, um, I don't know what, how old you are, but I know in my generation, 30. I'm in my late, late thirties at this point in my life. I hate to say that because I feel like I'm 25 still. Hey, I keep, but, you know, 30 is a around. weird number for me. I keep telling people. So my birthday was in April and what, we're just across October. I caught myself yeah. today telling someone I just turned 30 and I'm like, I got to stop saying that. It was a weird number for me. So I was like hanging yeah. on to that. I just turned 30 and now I got to just. Well, I always say I'm 29 plus seven. <laughs> like I don't like to, like, I don't want to feel like I'm already closer to 40 than I'm not because I don't feel that old. But, um, but my generation, I mean, we grew up with the mentality of Walmart's cheap. Walmart's the cheapest. Yeah. And so now I think we are pivoting to realize that Walmart is a corporation and I'm, and I don't want to pick on them, but this is just a good example because of how big they are. They're now not taking care of their employees the way they used to. And the consumer knows that. And the consumer doesn't want to support that bad behavior at the corporate level, but they are open 24 hours. So, you know, it's kind of the greater of two evils in some situations. If I'm going to shop big chain, I'm going to decide, okay, where do my personal standards sit and which one would I rather give my money to? Yeah. For me, I'm a Target shopper rather than a Walmart shopper, (laughs) but don't get me wrong. 
Target's got its own, you know, corporate faults and and whatever too. So it's it's the greater of two evils, really, with a lot of those situations. But when we're in an Amazon world of free shipping and instant, if you're a small business, you better make sure you have something really good to offer that Amazon does not. If you want people to come and shop with you, can I ask you this, Melissa? If, sure. Do you think that? Um, I just I thought of this as you were talking, but do you think that? from a marketing perspective, if you are selling to a female that um, the things that you're saying, they they source from local places, they blah, 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 you know, all of those things that you had listed um, at the beginning. Do you think if you're marketing towards a female audience that those things are more important to point out maybe than if you're marketing to a Absolutely. male? Absolutely. Well, um, and statistics will show you that females have 80% of the buying power in their household. <laughs> yeah. So if you are, that's probably a good I mean, play. I hate huh? to say it. My husband doesn't, when he does shop, he doesn't look at price. He just buys things. But he's physically in a retail store to shop maybe one out of 30 times that I am. Same. Um, you know, so again, yes, I think it absolutely matters to women. You know, we come, my husband and I come from a pharmacy background. Um, he's a pharmacist and we used to co-own one, um, in Northeastern Oklahoma and it was time to come home. That's why we're back. But we often saw like, think about this. If you're a mom with a sick kiddo, do you really want to park and have to go into the pharmacy to pick up your prescriptions? Hmm. No, you don't. You want that drive through window. Yeah. So you have to think about your demographic. And if you want the money to come from that demographic, what is it that they need to make it easy? Like remove that friction to make it easier for them to do business with you. So talk to me about um, your product, getting into your business even farther. Um, let's say that someone wants to, um, ha de they're deciding on their product offering or they're evaluating their product offering. I noticed that you don't have a ton of different um, products. Why do you why do you choose the amount of products you have and, and how many products do you offer? There's a lot of, that's a loaded question, Steve. <laughs> like, um, you know, to be honest, I like to do things different. Um, I know that in my industry as a whole, not just in the state of Oklahoma, because really the state of Oklahoma is irrelevant with the candy industry in a lot sure. of ways. But in the industry as a whole, chocolate is overdone. Um, that's why I don't do chocolate. Like I, I have to niche down and find my uniqueness, whether it be our product itself or the packaging or how we market it. Um, but for me, the caramel accidentally happened. And then I took that accidental start. Did you and even like caramel? And expanding from there. Yeah, I do. Oh, okay. But okay. it was my dad. My dad is a caramel or was. Um, we lost him almost 10 years ago, but he loved anything caramel. It was like anything from a Milky Way to he'd sit down with a whole bag of craft caramels, which are hard as a rock and will break your teeth, but he would <laughs> eat them. And so, you know, my dad was a foodie. I learned how to cook from my dad. And so when I wanted to make a sweet treat, um, or a treat for friends and family in his memory at Christmas. Um, I, I mean, it took me months to decide on what mm. I was going to test and try. And one day it just hit me like, oh my gosh, dad loved caramel. Like that's what he was always doing. It was either that or licorice jelly beans. And there's no <laughs> way I'm doing anything with licorice. That's disgusting. Um, but like, oh, gross. You know, I actually, as a joke, I don't know if you can see it, but well, there we go back there on the wall. Um, there's a canister of licorice Twizzlers just for That's display, funny. just because my dad liked licorice, but there's nothing else That's licorice awesome. in the store. But, you know, for me, it was taking that one product that gave us our accidental start, creating the brand around it, and then looking at the market as a whole and what's not out there and what would be cool or interesting that our demographic would be interested in. And so we, over time, tested and expanded on flavors of caramel. Then we added a toffee and then we've, you know, created um, a payday type candy bar. You know, it's, it's not a payday, obviously, because it doesn't have nougat in it, but it's our whiskey caramel with peanuts around it. So it's like a payday on steroids. But um, product creation is just I'm a creative mind naturally. So after rabbit holes, trend watching, uh, being part of the industry newsletters and see what flavor profiles are coming up. Mm it's been easy to create new things. But I also know from a company the size of ours, and because everything is made by hand, we can't have, you know, 200 SKUs. There's just not enough time to be able to hand create that many SKUs. So um, we keep it pretty small, but it's the 80-20 rule for any items that you, you know, market kind of like your workforce, the 80-20 rule. So um, we've chosen to stay small, 
to make sure that we never overpromise and under deliver on what our capabilities are. If you had, speaking of, of staying small, let's say you had 10 times the budget you have now, whether you took on an investor, you, you know, had, you won the lottery or whatever you want to imagine a, um, happening and you had 10 times the budget you have now, what would you spend it on? What do you think you're, you could um, do better? Well, or? logistically, I've got um, in the back of my mind a few things that would help us scale uh, equipment wise um, in we, like packaging. You know, I, I'm there's an internal battle within myself wanting to stay artisan and what that definition of artisan means. So it's like, where can we push that envelope on equipment assistance to help with scale and growth, but also maintain that that artisan quality? So for us right now, it would be a couple of pieces of equipment for packaging. But beyond that, it would be to grow our brand even further. So we have shipped to all states except Vermont. Why? Dang it, Vermont. Know. Let's go. <laughs> I know. I don't know. Like we ship a lot I'm gonna, like, to Texas, publish. Florida, I'm going to do like paid ads in Vermont for this. <laughs> right. Once. Well, and here's the deal. Like I could do that, <laughs> yeah. but I'm not going to do that. I want it to happen naturally. Like I have all these little. You should do like a marketing thing behind it. Like everyone I'm but like, Vermont loves our candy. We're gonna do this. <laughs> well, and it's like we bootstrapped this company, you know? So it's like, now that's not to say that if, you know, someone came and knocked on the door tomorrow and wanted to buy us, that it wouldn't be for sale for the right price. Okay. But I think every small um, business owner says that. <laughs> I naturally love a challenge and I'm a goal setter and I will like take the top goal and break it down to daily and hourly activities to reach that goal. That's just how I'm wired. And so for the 10 X budget, honestly, it would be to expand on our marketing and our brand. Um, but when, when you do that and you naturally get the extra orders from it, then you have to make sure you have the internal support to handle that volume change. So there'd have to be a balance between operational expenses and marketing. Um, if we had that bigger budget. So. Yeah, you bet. Um, as far as, um, we had talked before about something that no one agrees with you about. Um, and you said that you think there's two different types of people some that work in the business and some that work on the business. Explain what you mean by that. Um, the best explanation, honestly, and I, I just re-listened to this again, was the E-Myth book. I don't know if you've read, I've read that. i read about six I, times. I love, yeah. And honestly, I have a stack of books that I, some I read once a yeah. year because you take something new from it every year and others are about every three to five yeah. years. And that E-Myth was one that was a three to five year for me. Um, and this time I listened to it on, on audible rather than reading it because I can get lost in the candy making kitchen and have my earbuds in and, and kill a book in a day. So, oh, cool. um, the e-myth was a great way to kind of summarize what I'm talking about, but there's the technician, the manager and the entrepreneur, and it's very rare to find the entrepreneur in the manager, um, let alone adding the technician in there. So, you know, it's, it's, what uh, do you think you are very I'm honestly all three, all three. And I think that's why my business has grown to where it is. I'm not afraid. I, I'm still doing the candy making sure. right now. So that's the technician. Yep. Um, the manager is I'm still, you know, taking the the sales calls, the marketing calls, all the things, but I'm also realizing as the entrepreneur, I have to have this, my team growing into those roles. So I try to balance all three. Um, but again, you have to set that time as a CEO to work on and in your business. So there's, it's kind of like people talking about a work-life balance. That's a fable. There is no such thing as a work-life balance, but you can be really smart with how you schedule your time um, within your work hours. And I just have to make sure every week that I'm working on my business, not just in my business. So there's a lot of people that disagree with me on needing to be both. Um, and you know what? I think you, a business with the decent service or product could survive with someone that's one or the other, but where that business really grows and expands is if you can do both. I would imagine the argument around the, I just like to work on my business. I don't really like to do the stuff is that they yeah. would say, I'll just hire the people. What would you say to that person? Um, <laughs> people quit. Know, kind of makes <laughs> I'm probably going to cause friction by saying that and get some hate mail. I'm going to say, don't be lazy. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to say set yeah. the example for your team. Um, if your team sees that you're willing to clean the toilet, they're going to be more excited to clean the toilet themselves. So yes, there comes a time in growing your business that you have to not be the person to clean the you toilet, bet. but you have to be willing to clean the toilet to create that culture and that company growth. So um, I don't know. I, 
put that person in my face. We'll talk to, about it. So, <laughs> so what about the flip side of the coin? Say the person that um, they say, I don't have time. I, I, I don't, I don't know how to hire somebody or I don't have the money to hire somebody or um, it's fine. I'll just stay at this size forever. Um, what, what would you say to that person on the flip side? I would say, well, if that makes you happy, go right on ahead. Sure. <laughs> but I would also say that we're all given the exact same 24 hours in a day. Um, and it's what you do with those 24 hours that counts. So you need to probably realign your priorities if you want your business to stay even just stable. Um, and if you're happy with not growing, then that's fine. But if you want to grow, you have to prioritize things. And if you know, I let, I used to volunteer in so many organizations and there, be, there came a point in time in my professional life that I had to say, you know what, now is not the time anymore in my life to spend 10 hours a week volunteering with X, Y. It's not a no forever. It's a no, not right now. So you just have to realign your priorities and, and your why in life. And perhaps so. you can be less of a volunteer, but more of a donor or something like that as well, you know? Right, right. Absolutely. Absolutely. So it seems like, you know, you had mentioned the books and the audio books and the podcasts. Um, you're on a podcast. Uh, yeah. How do you feel about personal development, personal growth? Do you think that when we talk about the business owner that doesn't have um, the knowledge or doesn't have the, you know, they don't want to be the working on the business type of person. Do you think that that's a laziness thing? Do you think a lot of people don't have the the um, skills or what do you think that is? I think it's it, all of the above. Again, it really is going to boil. And I don't, I think Enneagram is a little overused right now, but well, I'll just use that as an example. If your Enneagram number is not a strength that naturally you're apt to do those things, then that would make sense why you make excuses or don't do it. So again, I would say, take your strength and build on your strength but also be smart on that and recognize where your weaknesses are. And if those weaknesses are something you're willing to research and educate to strengthen on, great. Or if you can bring on a partner that can complement and, you know, bring in those strengths that are your weaknesses and then do it. But um, I think there are a lot of lazy people out there and I think it's okay to admit if you're not an entrepreneur, if you like the idea of being an entrepreneur, but aren't willing to put the work in, then it's just not for you. And that's okay. I think people need to learn that that's okay to not be a business owner yeah. or to recognize when it's time to step away. Exactly. And this, this idea of being unique, being peculiar, even down to, you know, obviously we don't know each other, um, before this, but even down to, as I was doing research on your website and, you know, going through some of the things that you've done, it, it was incredible, Melissa. I, I mean, I hope you take this as a compliment, but even down to like the name of your business was unique. Mm -hmm. The wording on the website was unique. The, the way that you even moved through your website was unique. There was, um, I'm going to imagine that a lot of people that are listening to this haven't been to your website before you have a picture of a crazy old time candy store on your deal. And it says, yeah. this has, in, in roundabout words, I don't know exactly what it said, but this has nothing this has to nothing do with to our do business. With However, yeah. we wish we came from some old still deal candy store, but um, yeah. we didn't, you know, I mean, I mean, everything about your, your website, your packaging, everything seems different. Can I ask you, do you think that that's a gift that you have to think of unique things? Or do you think that you learn that somehow? Um, probably both, to be honest. Again, I'm I'm definitely more of a marketing mind, um, naturally, my God-given talent. So I think that that's um, very easy. You know, I, my background is in horticulture. I'm an ag girl. I showed livestock, like um, a horse girl, <laughs> I, although I haven't had one in many, many years. Um, I know, right before this, I was doing like a fertilizer meeting. I was like, dang, I was reading this. I'm like, I should just ask her if she wants to like tune in for that too. <laughs> well, I've been out of the industry for 10 <laughs> years. So, you know, there's, yes, some of that knowledge never goes away, but there's a learning curve. And if you're not in it, you forget it. But um you know, I, I think, yes, naturally, I maybe rather than my landscape design degree, which I'm so thankful to my old ag teacher for helping me with the college scholarships to to go to O State for no cost. That was great. And I was good at landscaping. But I think when it boils down to it, I'm even better at marketing and growing um, a business. But um, yeah, I think I, I'm definitely given that gift naturally. Um, I think if you're somebody that's not find someone that is that can help you with those things. Um, 
it's a pain point for me. Like I'm, I'm a very empathetic person naturally. Um, when I see a small business and I go to its website and there's a lot of friction or you can't even find a way to buy the product, I naturally want to call them and say, can I give you three hours of my time? And just from, from someone that's been there, done that, someone that has this just kind of God given talent, you know, can I steer you a little bit, you know, but you have to be careful when you come at that because some people will take events to it or if they're in love with it and they created it themselves, they don't see that there's anything wrong with it. And that's, that's a tricky situation, but I definitely being someone that sees a value in books and podcasts. And, um, I mean, this sounds crazy, but now that you've talked to me, you might understand it. When my husband was, when we were still owner, co-owners of a pharmacy, we would go all the state conventions and, there were as many continuing ed classes for a pharmacist that I wanted to sit down on because they were about marketing and business. Uh. So I'm kind of just that nerd that likes to learn different perspectives, you know, whether it be Donald Miller with building a story brand or Mike Michalowicz with profit first. Mike's going to be on stuff. Friday. On the oh my gosh. I am like a Mike group. So I might have to like come hey. in and like pop in the background and be like, Hey, no. <laughs> No, I profit first has changed our business financially. Wow. So because I'm a creative mind, I'm not naturally a numbers person. Like I'm capable of doing it, but that's my husband's brain. And so profit first has just changed our that's business cool. life, to be honest. So anyway, that's exciting. Yeah. I can't wait to yeah, hear that I'm one. Pumped but uh, that's a big landing. Congrats, Thank Steve. You. Like he's a big deal. Call. <laughs> Sales is mine. Is my street. Yeah. What? What's he? I think his college nickname was like Mike McCallishitz or something like <laughs> yeah, that. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> Uh, yeah, he so, just, but I have gifted his book to, I don't know how many small business owner friends of mine that if they start asking like who my bookkeeper, which I do have a bookkeeper, but you know, when they start asking those questions on how do you price things or how do you figure out your profit? I'm like, oh my gosh, have you heard of? And so I love being able to give, have you read his new one on, on marketing? It just came out like, a, huh? have you read his new book on marketing? Yes. Oh no. Audible. Just done. came. Yeah. Listen to it in yeah. a day. Now I need to order the paperback or the hardback. I mean, so I can make notes yeah. in it, but no, like the, I pre-ordered it on audible. Oh, look the day at it you. Came out, I was You're a really are a Mike fan, huh? So, that's yeah, awesome. He's awesome. Yeah, that's cool. So, but, um, but no, I, th I think you just, you have to in business. If you're not willing to always learn, you're like stale bread and you're dead. You so know? let me ask you this. There's a, um, there's two books I'm, I'm thinking of off the top of my head. One's written by Chase Jarvis. He's a professional photographer. I don't know if you know who he is. And then the other no. one is written by James Altucher. Um, and both of those books, uh, talk about how they think that, um, creativity and, and, um, new ideas and stuff like that is basically kind of like, uh, you could equate it to, um, self-control. It's a muscle mm -hmm. and the more you flex it and the more you work at creativity, the more that you can grow that creativity muscle. And I, I really believe that. I don't know if that, you know, obviously you can't prove that scientifically or anything, but, um, right, right. I, I really that's, feel that's like the people yeah. that work at creativity and try to, I mean, I'm not, I don't feel like I'm naturally a creative person, but I feel like I, can create a lot of un unique things. Um, right. But you understand your demographic and that's probably enables that creativity to come out. And how do you, how, I guess, you know, let's say someone, let's go back to the website example. And, and I don't want to hound on that all day long, but if someone is saying, Hey, I know my website's not good, <laughs> you know, or, right, or like you were right. saying with the, with the numbers, like, I know I'm not good at numbers or whatever. And they say, I, I don't know what to do though. Um, what would you, what advice would you give that person coming from a creative person? What would you say to them? Um, I would first say, do you have the budget to hire someone? And when you do hire someone, here's how you find out if they're worth their weight in gold. Um, and if they can't afford to hire someone, I would say, guess what? We're in a Google copy, you know, world. We're in a YouTube world. There are platforms like we personally use Weebly that Square bought a few years ago. Gotcha. Um, but there's Shopify. I mean, there's so many platforms now that make website design literally as easy as drag and drop. You do not have to know coding. You do not have to know any of that anymore to create your own website. But find like Donald Miller building a story brand. His website and program is affordable. The book is great. His podcast is free and gives loads of information, but that alone will teach you just the guts of what you need in a good website to actually draw people in and keep them on your website. So 
again, I, I hate to say excuses are like buttholes. Everybody's got one and they all stink, yeah. but they do. Yeah. <laughs> like, so find the research. Especially in you know, 2021. Um, or if you see a company that's got a great website that you love the look of, email them. I mean, what's the worst they can or do? Copy Not respond it. to your email. That's what we did for right. 10 years. So I would just like right. look up top websites and I would literally copy, you know, I would just try to or look at a national brand, yeah. you know, look at, okay, what is Walmart's website? What are the guts of their website? Where is the placement of their toolbar? Is their logo prominent? What's at the bottom? Like, those companies have unlimited budget to hire the right people and probably have their own in-house people, obviously, to keep up with it. But look at those big brands and look at the framework of what their website has and then copy it. You so. mentioned your um, dad that you lost in 2011 and mm -hmm. um, not to obviously I know that this would never be like a marketing um, ploy or anything sure. like that, but do you think that this idea of being peculiar, being unique, do you think that the reason behind starting this business, do you think that even that makes you unique and that you maybe, you know, do things differently because of the reason? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I know not everyone is, I mean, able to experience something unfortunate or fortunate, no matter the situation, um, to create a business around it. Um, and I really do feel like because I'm naturally an entrepreneur. I mean, I can tell stories about being like 10 or 11 years old and buying beanie babies and reselling them at the flea market and making money. Like my dad was the one to take me to those things. Like we went to gun shows together and I got to watch him buy a, a pocket knife or a handgun that he knew its value and could buy it and turn around and make a couple hundred bucks on it. <laughs> so a lot of that is like natural behavior that I'm born with. And some of that is learned behavior, but, um, but yeah, I think all of us have a period in of our life, no matter what it is, that we could create a business out of something that frustrates us, that we see a niche, like a, a missing part of the industry, if you will. Yeah. Um, one final question um, before, before, and then before I get to that, I do just want to reiterate again, you know, um, I kind of asked you to do the podcast before I really knew a topic. And as I was going through your website, I'm, I mean, in all seriousness, you're, everything about your business is unique. And I, I do want to, um, uh, congratulate you or whatever you're on, on how unique your business is. Um, thank you. So one final question, if you had to give one piece of advice to someone that is perhaps they're listening to this and they know that their business is boring or they know that they've just been trying to copy Walmart or Amazon for the last 10 years or whatever it might be. Um, or maybe they're just trying to imagine a business or they want to start a business and they, they are hearing what you're saying and they agree with that and they want to, um, go from there and, and become more unique. What would you say to that person? Um, I would say if you're not someone that's naturally able to take three steps back and look at your business with consumer eyes rather than ownership eyes, um, you need to find your tribe or find someone that can help you do that. Um, I will also say that family is the first to um, let you down, so to speak, or be bad judges. They have a different and lens. Honestly, they have a different lens, but their lens is coming from that they love you and they want to protect you from failure. And so they're naturally, unfortunately, a little bit negative sometimes rather than being that cheerleader, that encourager you need. So although you need 100 percent support of your business behind you to grow, you need to find a tribe. You need to find the other business people at your level or one or two levels above that have been there and done that and that you guys can meet maybe a group of five of you, four or five once a week for about an hour and just vent, share ideas, ask questions, because more heads are better than one, but you need to be in that same level playing field rather than just with the people that naturally want to protect you and shield you from a potential failure or a risk. You bet. So. Man, thank you so much for uh, being yeah. on. I, I really think that um, there's several different nuggets that people can take away from this, and um, I'm sure that we'll be able to get some pretty good uh, clips yeah for social media. I want to squeeze in real quick. You brought up that old picture on our website. So funny story, funny, not funny. Um, and I have a whole new like goal now, um, for business growth, because this is not a get rich thing, quick thing for me by any means. Um, that black and white picture is of my husband's great uncle, Andrew Wedman. What? 
And did you know this? In, you knew yes. this before. I did not know this until two years ago. What? Okay. So our business is five years old. Two years ago, my oldest sister-in-law, who mind you is two years younger than my mom, my husband was an oopsie baby. Huh. Um, <laughs> she said, you know, I seem to remember hearing one time that Uncle Andrew Wedman had a candy shop in Yukon a long time ago. D- did you know that? And I was like, what are you talking about? Well, I never knew Andrew. My husband never knew Andrew. That He owned the candy shop in 1913. Okay. So I'm like, what are you talking about? So I called our family historian, who is my father-in-law's twin brother, Don Wedman. um, And I was like, hey, Uncle Don, Lisa seems to think that Andrew used to have a candy shop in town, but I have never heard of it. I've looked at the Oklahoma Historical Society's website in their database, can't really find much about it. Do you know anything? And he was like, I've never heard anything about that, but I'll dig through some pictures. He found me three pictures. So my new goal is to buy that building on Main Street in Yukon and open up the Palace Confectionery again. What? Now, I don't know if recently it's been sold, but it was for sale very recently. I'm just not in a position to snag what? it. Um, but it was what Betsy's Boutique was in that same building on the north end of Main Street called the Sanger Building. And so Palace Confectionery was owned by Andrew Wedman and his business partner, Ralph Lawson, who used to raise racehorses in Yukon in the early 1900s. Ralph married into the family. He married a sister of Andrew's um, and they only owned it for a couple of years. But the old ads I can find on the Historical Society's website talk about um, they sold cigars. And they sold candy. And the pictures I have hanging on the wall here in the shop show um, a soda count, uh, soda fountain. Yeah. Counter. So I, that's my new goal. Buy that, that building crazy. and reopen. My husband's a cigar guy. So, um, you know, as the pharmacy industry changes, he's kind of getting a little burnt out. And at some point would like to maybe at least part-time get away from some of that. So I'm like, hey, you could run the cigar part of it. We could have a really cool humidor. And then I could, and of course we wouldn't be able to manufacture our candy on, on site, but we would totally bring it back as the Palace Confectionery by Molly Coddled Hash Slinger and let it be a tourist attraction. That's crazy. So that's that's my new goal. It might be a, a 20 year goal or not. Um, I don't even want to know what they want for that building and, and what it might need to work on it. But uh, I'd love for that to be back in the family one of these days. That's nuts. So. Huh? Crazy story. Yeah. Yeah. I know. It's like meant to be. So like let me circle. ask you like, this. Did you have the picture on there before he you knew all that? Or you put no, the, oh, okay, no, okay, okay. no, Uncle Don went down to Baker Photo on Main Street. And I had thought you just like farming. pulled out something off of Google, like old. No, oh, okay. No, I was like, and those, That's pictures, insane. those pictures are not even on Oklahoma Historical's website. Gotcha. Uncle Don owns the, the original. That's crazy. Of those. Huh. So, and they're, I mean, they're the coolest pictures. It's like you can tell they're having a Christmas party in the candy <laughs> yeah. shop because there's like a paper bell hanging with like Tinsel Garland. And these guys are like dressed to the nines of that era, you know, in bow ties and full suits. And um, anyway, they're, they're really great pictures. But it just like now we have this pull of it started because of my dad's memory. And now we've got the Wedman side brought into it. And it, it's just a fun thing. That's for us crazy. To grow huh? What a so, cool story. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for being on. I, I really do appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Hey, thank you so much for listening to another episode of the Better Business Podcast with me, your host, Steve Cook. You know, starting or growing a business is hard work. So I hope that today's advice made it just a little bit easier for you. We'll be sharing more about this exact topic all this week on my social platforms. You can find me on Instagram, LinkedIn, TikTok, or if you would like to get a a personalized blog post from me on this topic, you can join my email list and I will send you an email once a week. You can check the show notes to subscribe to that or find me on my website, whatever's easier for you. Now get out there and go grow a better business with this advice from today's Real Pros. Thank you for listening.